Hi everybody, my name is Carla Moore and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Carla. I want to thank Brandy for inviting me here tonight. I want to thank Larry for his talk. I'm just going to say in another 40 minutes or so, the same thing, the same thing over and over again. The message is, you know, uh, I am somebody who cannot drink. I have a, I have a, an allergy of the body that, uh, that when I ingest alcohol, something happens for me that doesn't happen for non-alcoholics. I've got an obsession of the mind. I've got, I've got this crazy head that, that always brings me back to looking at that first drink. Always, 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 and um, and I've got a spiritual malady. I've got that idea that somehow I'm separate from God. That somehow, I run on fear. I uh, that I can't access that power greater than myself. That uh, and I'm self-centered and selfish to the extreme. And um, and I didn't know that for a long time. I'm so grateful to be here, and if you're new, I hope that you stay long enough to, to hear it for yourself, to be able to experience some of this for yourself. Um, I discovered what alcohol could do for me when I was 12 years old. Now, that wasn't my first drink, but it was a magic drink. You know, it was the one that did it for me, the one that told me, I want, that, that let me know I wanted to do this now, forever, often, you know. Uh, my first drink, I, you know, I was a little toddler. I mean, I was in the kitchen uh, uh, in my parents' house. I, I was rumbling around, fumbling around, and I found the, uh, uh, the cupboard under the kitchen sink, you know, and I made my way past the pine saw and the cleanser and the, uh, back to the bottle of CC or uh, Jack Daniels or whatever it was back there, the only bottle in the house at the time, and made my way back there. And the next thing that uh, my parents knew was I was sitting in the middle of my kitchen uh, you know, two years old or whatever, and I've got booze running down the front of me, and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. And, you know, I'm not proud to tell you, but, you know, many of my drunks at the very end of my drinking were much the same as that. <laughs> Just, I wasn't, it, you know, I love that line in the book that says, uh, alcohol, an alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature. I mean, it's just really true. Um, I, uh, I come from a family that's, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty sick. I mean, uh, uh, it didn't make me an alcoholic, but there's a lot of alcoholism in my family. It runs rampant like the Colorado River through our, <laughs> through our family. And uh, um, it, it just seemed like the normal life. Um, my mom loved to party, and my, uh, my, step, my father left us, and I was mad at him for a very long time about that. I didn't like the man that she married after that, and he knocked us around a lot. And um, You know, I, basically when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought that it, I would have told you if you had my life, you'd drink too. You know, it was just like that. My sister committed suicide when she was 17. My brother had uh, a, died at 30 of bad alcoholism. Uh, you know, I mean, if you had my life, you'd drink too. And um, the the time I found a little relief in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. I'm one of those kids that you know that peaked early and started going downhill as soon as I found alcohol. I mean, uh, Larry was talking about dreams, you know, and uh, I had uh, dreams up until maybe a. Becoming an attorney, I remember at uh, 12 years old, I, I was sitting in my social studies class looking at the teacher. He had been an attorney one time, and I thought, I thought maybe I can be an attorney one time, like uh, someday, like uh, like Mr. Whatever his name was. And and uh, and the nearest I got to that was uh, uh, the following year I uh, needed one. I found myself needing an attorney, and, um, and that was as close as I ever got. Um, when I discovered the effect that alcohol produced in me, and I discovered my mother's medicine cabinet, it's all I wanted to do, and everything that uh, got in the way of that, just had to go. My friends had to go, sports had to go, school had to go, and I began to uh, find my hope in the medicine cabinet and the liquor cabinet. And, um, and I'm the kind of person that when I get fed up, I, uh, I got to leave, you know. I got my first social resentment in school. Now, I was one of those kids that, you know, were entering junior high school, entering puberty, you know, and, uh, uh, I'd go over to some of these kids' house where their parents weren't home, and we'd grab whatever they had to drink, and we'd drink that, and then we'd find an empty bottle and play spin the bottle, you know, and, and get together and do that. And uh, I got my first social resentment when I realized that uh, I'd gone into the bedroom with a boy, and uh, fooled, we fooled around together, and then both of us came back out, and only one of us was a slut. And I never could <laughs> quite get my head around that. And got my... Uh, that's a little delayed reaction, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> it's, but you know, I, I didn't understand those moral social codes. You know, it, the girls who said they did and didn't and did and said they did whatever it was, and uh, and and so I and I just 
life just didn't make sense anymore. I mean, uh, a home didn't make sense, school didn't make sense, and I began to withdraw. And I left a lot of my hopes and dreams on the on the girls' room at the at Edgewood Junior High School. I mean, I'd ditch my my classes and and wind up in the girls' room, and we'd smoke and we'd drink and and uh, and withdraw. And um, after a while, I got fed up and I started to leave. And I was hopeless at home and hopeless at school. And I began to find my hope out on the open road. And I'd get out there on the 10 freeway going east or the 101 freeway going north, and I'd be on my way to somewhere else, somewhere other than here and somebody other than me. And that's all I wanted to be, just relief from what was going on. And I never made any big plans about what I was going to do when I got there. 35 cents in my pocket felt like faith to me, you know. And uh, be on my way. We, I found myself in a place uh, called North Beach at the age of 14 in the San Francisco area with a friend of mine, a couple of guys offered us money for sex, and we did the next indicated thing, and boom, a whole new career path opened up for us, um, you know. <laughs> I never developed any particular marketing strategy as far as that went, <laughs> but uh, you know, I was just living a day at a time. I mean, I, I don't really want to diss the profession. Some women seem to do okay, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but I was not one of them. I mean, Heidi Fleiss, you know, she... Uh, <laughs> She seemed to do okay. She was kind of like the Neiman Marcus of the profession, right? And, and, and me, I'm more like the 99 cent store. It just, and I don't want to diss the 99 cent store, but I was not in good shape at the age of 14 in San Francisco and then, uh, you know, on over to the Tenderloin area talking to a pimp named Johnny, you know, and I just, I thought, oh, he looks like Michael Jackson. He was, uh, yeah, I don't know. But, uh, you know, so I left San Francisco with a trade and an abscess, and on we went. Uh, and I'd go back home, and I'd try to integrate back into the home. I'd try to go back to school, live with mom, live with dad. And uh, the more that I would go out on the street, out on the road, out adventuring on that spiritual quest, the less I was able to come back and tell you what I'd done on my summer vacation. You know, it just was not uh, was not the same. They weren't talking about that in uh, at Royal Oaks High School. And I went to a lot of different high schools. And, and I never finished any of that. And I started getting locked up. I, I mean, I spent most of my adolescence in, in one lockup or another, uh, first at Juvenile Hall, and then uh, mm -hmm. Mental Hospital, and then the rehab, and then the girls' home. So my class reunions now are much like this, in AA meetings. And uh, it's like, oh, Juvenile Hall, 1972. Oh, yeah, Riverside, 1973. <laughs> Ingleside Mental Health Center, 1973, and, <laughs> and the rehab and the girls' home. And I have met someone from almost every one of those places and, uh, in sobriety, and nobody is sober. I, I don't know why I'm the lucky one at this moment or was the lucky one at that moment, but uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's just it's, I believe that grace falls on us all, and, and when we get that window of grace, it's up to me to step right through it, to step through and hang on and to start doing the things that we do around here. Um, I have to stay in here with you. I gotta, uh, I have to, I have to do these things. And thank God I had a sponsor who said, it's not a requirement that I like the stuff that we do around here because I don't always, I don't always feel like doing it. My spirit, my, my, the way that I think is kind of like this. Um, a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine died suddenly last week of a heart attack. She just laid down and, and died. And, um, and my first thought after that was, see, I need to get the motor home and take off. I need to get the motor home and the surfboard and just leave. And, uh, you know, I have a nice little condo in the valley, and I've got grandkids, and I've got stability. And, but my first thought was, okay. And I used to follow my feelings like they were spiritual experiences to be uh, definitely, to definitely go on. And um, it, Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a little consistency and a little bit of, uh, of stability and a little bit of peace, and I don't have to go running off on every thought that I, that I have. I'm really, uh, really not like that. Any, uh, I, don't, or I don't have to be like that. I do think like that. Um, so I started getting locked up, and I, I, I found myself in that mental hospital at the age of 15, and I was supposed to be there two weeks. I ended up being there for a year. I just sort of took to the place I really, uh, they were giving me Thorazine, Melaril, Valium, uh, daily nutritional supplements, you know, uh, Dalmain sleepers in case that wasn't enough. And I was restless, irritable, and discontent at a level I can't even describe to you today. I was angry, and I didn't know, I, I couldn't describe it to you beyond that. I uh, threw things, I hit people, I hurt people, and, uh, and, and I 
became intimately familiar with five point restraints in that mental hospital and and uh, I, it's just the way I was. I mean, I got busy there. Uh, there's always a boyfriend to be found in the mental hospital. Um, <laughs> I liked all the boys, but my favorites were the big bad boys, you know, the ones that would uh, knock me around or knock you around or uh, that seemed tough. I mean, I'm always mistaking brute strength for strength of character and uh, arrogance for confidence. And uh, and that's what I was looking at back then. And, um, and so it, my boyfriends were, con as a consequence, they were always leaving. They were always getting hauled off to YA for one reason or another. I mean, my first boyfriend got hauled off to, for, uh, throwing a chair through the window and my next boyfriend was hauled off for throwing a nurse through the window and um, and I just sit out on the smoke break bench and smoke tragic cigarettes and play Diana Ross songs and watch them go you know it's very romantic <laughs> touch me in the morning then just walk away and, uh, and then the ever popular when will I see you again <laughs> I went over to the co-ed unit and one of the counselors there told me that I needed to learn how to relate to men on something other than a horizontal level and I didn't get that either. And then wound up on the intensive care unit. Um, I was always looking for that power, that exchange, that energy from the outside. Um, always looking to feel better from the outside in. And um, I, I discovered in Alcoholics Anonymous that as soon as I learned how to give from the inside out, that hole got smaller and I, and I don't need so much from the outside anymore. Um, but Every day I have to focus on that. Every day I've got to practice that. It's a daily thing. I can have a white light spiritual experience tonight. I still got to wake up in the morning and ask God to help me through that day. Every day. It's a daily maintenance. And that's, I mean, I've seen people go out at 12 years, at 20 years, at 30 years. Um, it's not that they never had it. It's that we're, we have to do it every day. I have to do it every day. Um, uh, moving on to, from the, I, I finally went over the over the wall at the mental hospital. Went over the wall at the rehab. Uh, the only place I couldn't ever get out of was Central Juvenile Hall, and and it, it's uh, it, the walls were just too high. But I've gotten to bring women now in in Alcoholics Anonymous in sobriety. I've gotten to bring women. <laughs> at least no, we got. I get to bring women to the to panels out there and talk to those kids, the kids who were just like me back then, who were. But we're just not ready. I mean, I found God and I was real willing when I was locked up, you know, and I can't get out because I hate, I am not, I, a friend of mine puts it like this, I do not jail well. Um, <coughs> I can't get, I can't get a drink. I can't get what I need to feel better in there. And I don't have a program. I don't have a fellowship or a God. So I, uh, I've, I'm left with me and untreated alcoholism when I'm locked up and I just, I don't like it. Um, but, uh, uh I bring panels um, out there to, uh, or I, I did bring panels out there to the girls and I get to see the blank looks on their faces and how it just doesn't apply to them and, and just hope that I plant a seed, you know. Lisa and I were out there one time and ended up locked up in the yard. Uh, people forgot about us and we were standing there in the yard. It was a very, very eerie feeling for a little while, but uh, anyway. Uh, <coughs> Just, you know, onto the, onto the girls' home and never went out the front door of any of those places. And besides that, I know when I hit the street what's going to fix me. As soon as I'm done, I mean, a lot of people were trying to give me some good information on the inside of those places. But I get to the outside and i got to have a drink. i got to have a drink right now. It fixes me immediately. It is quicker than a prayer. It is quicker than an apology or any of that stuff I have to do to have a relationship with you. It just uh, works for me right away. So I don't really, I'm not looking for anything else. And besides that, now I'm co-signed. I mean, those psychiatrists were talking to me about disorders. I was a very disordered child and I needed all that medication. But it seemed to me then when I'd get out, I didn't have to chase the medication, I had booze. And so it just seemed to me that that was a solution. And I'm one of those people who jumps right from the frying pan into the fire, you know. Uh, my solutions are always worse than my problems. but. Um, so I drink and I get to that girl's home and we run away from there and I told you I've always been on a spiritual quest. It's not that I don't believe in God. I, I, I believe that there's a God. I just didn't know how to access that power for myself. I was born into a Southern Baptist home. I believe we were going to hell at, from the time I was six. I identified with Merle Haggard when I was six. You know, Mama tried and it uh, and she'd always say, you know, you're going to hell. She'd love that. Um, and it was her perception, it was my perception, I bought it, and um, it's not what, I, I, don't know what, I don't know what they say, but um, I don't have any beef with any religions these days, but I tried Catholicism, it just seemed to me on the surface that my friends uh, who were Catholic, they had, I, I'd see, 
little pictures of girls in white dresses around the house, you know, kneeling and saying the rosary and, and uh, their mothers saying prayers over white candles. And see, they seem to have a happy life. They seem to be getting what they wanted. And so I try that for a little while, but I'm very impatient and I don't dig too deep, you know. So I moved on to something else, started burning black candles and praying to the other guy for a while, <laughs> thinking maybe I'd hedge my bets a little bit. And the best idea of a higher power, of a God, of strength and serenity that I could ever get was uh, when the television series Kung Fu came out. I was in the sixth grade, and some of you might remember that. And the, the star of the show was Kane, uh, or David Carradine, and his character was Kane. And he stood tall, and he was very, had a very peaceful look about his face, and pearls of wisdom just rolled off his tongue, you know? Just the killing of a man does no man honor and just stuff like that. It was just great. And when they messed with him, he kicked their ass, you know, and I just, I wanted what he had. Um, it, strength and serenity, and that's the idea that I walked around with in my head, and, and along with my copy of Baba Ram Dass, Be Here Now, trying to figure out what that meant, and I uh, ended up leaving and going out to the river and up to Oregon where God might be. We were up in Eugene, Oregon, a college town. It's very cool, very Grateful Dead kind of thing up there. And I'm thinking, things are going to change up there. It was something different. I mean, when they talk about hoeing up there, they mean with a garden tool. You know what I mean? So uh, we planted a garden in the front yard. And we were going to be organic. And it's, it's just going to be. And I'm up there with normal people. I'm up there with people who can smoke one joint, drink one beer, get up, go clean the oven, move on with their life, and, and, and things are okay. And I get up there, I smoke a joint, I have a cigarette, I drink a beer, and I gotta have another beer. And then I gotta have another beer. And then I don't care about a broom, I don't care about a house. I don't care about anything but the next beer, or the next drink, or the next party. And, uh, and that's where I go. And pretty soon my friends had to, to say the words to me that lots of people after that were gonna say. And if you sleep on other people's couches like I do when you're out there, then you've heard these words too. And it was, Carla, you know, we really love you, but you gotta go. <laughs> gotta go it's time and <laughs> little idea there uh, and all over Oregon and back down to uh, I, I tried to live with my father for a little while I'm 17 and a half years old and I can't get off his couch and back uh, over in uh, LA with him and and I can't get off his couch uh, he's got a beautiful liquor cabinet and I'm drinking out of it and he doesn't drink a drop and I just keep drinking and I don't know how to tell him I'm afraid I don't know how to tell him that I that I've got to hide where I've been I don't understand where I've just been I don't know why I, I, I know I'm crazy I must be I mean I've got shrinks that say I'm crazy I just came out from three years of lockup and and I, there's something very very wrong with me I don't know how to go out there without a drink I don't know how to go out there really with a drink and uh, and I sat on his couch and I drank his booze until right before my 18th birthday he came to me and he said what I know today were the hardest words he ever had to say to his oldest daughter, and that was, I'm not going to watch you die, and I'm not going to help you do it. you got to go. And I knew those, that was coming. I knew it. And uh, the other thing I heard Larry say, too, you know, all those excuses, all those things we, we use, and, and I used to think that it was just because I wasn't 18 yet, that if they, when I get to be 18, I'll be able to do what I want, and they won't hassle me so much. I'll be of legal age, and, and I can do what I want. And, and I, I have to tell you that after I left uh, my father's house, I remembered that one of the guys in the rehab, one of the counselors, had told me I was a great actress. And I guess I must have misunderstood, but I ended up on Hollywood Boulevard. And um, <laughs> not a lot of auditioning going on there. But <laughs> And then about three days into that, I'm uh, uh, standing out on the corner, Sunset and Poinsettia. And, uh, this car pulls around and I put my hand on the door handle and the next thing I know I'm laying across the trunk of an unmarked car with my hands in silver bracelets and um, and I'm on my way down to the Wilcox station to talk to the police some more and, and now I'm over 18 and my excuse about that is gone if they, they did leave me alone and now I am over 18 and now I'm still talking to the police and and that's where I go and I stayed out there for a little while. A few months into that, that little jaunt in Hollywood, I met a man walking down Hollywood Boulevard. And I just love to tell this story because it's just the way that my higher power works in my life. But I met this guy walking down Hollywood Boulevard. I saw the light in his eyes, and I didn't know it was orange sunshine. But we got along, and <laughs> chatted it up, and moved in together that night. I mean, I didn't even learn his last name. And six weeks later, he's asking me to leave, and I still don't know his last name. But. Uh, He was on my eight-step list when I, when I, in my first year of sobriety when I got sober, and, and I didn't know how to find him, and I, I had to just give him to my sponsor and, and ask her what to do. And, and Larry talked about change, too, and uh, 
and, and, and I really wanted to change. It, I, I couldn't find them. I didn't know how. And so she gave me some things to do, how to, how to treat men. My first home group uh, was almost like a men's stag on Thursday night. It was uh, two or three women and like 30 guys. And it was a good practice place for me. It was just brought to my attention just not long ago. There was a good practice place. I mean, I didn't sleep with them. I just, I had learned how to be their friend. I learned how to, to, how to uh, relate to men on a vertical level, you know, and, um, and that was in Alcoholics Anonymous, but this guy, uh, so that was the way I started too, and, I, and the eight step keeps us willing and, and able, and uh, right before my 13th AA birthday, I had to go out and give a talk at a, at a meeting across town, and, and it was one of those hot days where I did not feel like going to fulfill that commitment. I, I wished that I could be anywhere but there, but I've been taught in Alcoholics Anonymous to be where I say I'm gonna be when I say I'm gonna be there, and, and I went out there that afternoon and I gave that talk, and when that talk was over, this man walked up to me and said, where were you in 1976? And I looked out and it was this guy from Hollywood, and, uh, the, and he had eight and a half years of sobriety, and I had almost 13, and I got to make direct amends to him, and it was just like one of those little hugs from the universe that says, keep going, Carla, like you're on the right track. And uh, he said, oh my God, that's long forgiven, long forgotten. He said, I just can't believe you're still alive. You know, the things that we were doing back then, I just don't, I can't believe you're still alive. And just the only, just the only link to the past that I had during that time. And uh, so that was great, but it was a long time coming. And I hooked up with another guy from another rehab and we were traveling all over yet again, looking on that spiritual quest up and down the California coast, flying on the coattails of the 60s. You know, we really liked the idea of peace and love and all that stuff. But I was like 12 in 1969, so I was a day late and a dollar short for even that. Uh, uh, but we liked the idea, but we just couldn't stop knocking the hell out of each other long enough to really implement the principle of peace and love. And, so uh, up and down the California coast, we pitched a tent in the mountains in Southern Oregon and lived there for a little while till the rain came and moved into a roofless cabin up north of uh, Grants Pass and in the mountains up there. And then the baby came and we moved into a little trailer. Uh, it was about 15 feet long and about four feet wide. <laughs> and we lived there and until she was about 10 months old. And I tried to treat my alcoholism with all kinds of things. I tried to smoke pot for, for the for the kid for a while. It was herbal, you know, and I thought it would be better for her. Um, but as soon as I could drink, it was just, I, I had to get back to the drink. The drink is what makes me feel good right now. And, um, and so uh, she was about 10 months old and got in the way of one of our fights and I had to take her and we went up to Idaho. And now it's been moonshine and beer in, in Oregon and now it's scotch in Idaho and nothing's changing. I have three jobs up there, tending bar and cocktail waitressing, an alcoholic stream, and I still can't bring home enough money to pay rent for more than a week at a time. Thank God for all those rent by the week motels up and down the main drag up there. My daughter by now is one of those kids that you see in her t-shirt and her un underwear and yesterday's lunch going down the front of it because her mom's not paying attention. Other women are coming over and seeing my daughter and then buying her clothes because her mother's not. And, um, and it was just all about the drink. And we lost a couple of places and, and, um, and then it was rent by the week motels and then we're back down. And I'm renting a room for my aunt in Covina and I'm working in a bar in Hollywood. And, Every, uh, my daughter's almost four years old by then, and every afternoon I'd kiss my little girl goodbye, and I'd take off from, from uh, Covina, and I'd start off for that bar in Hollywood, and I'd stop at the halfway point, which was Arcadia, and I'd have my uh, primer drinks, you know, my drinks, my shots of Cuervo Gold and Budweiser backs, the drinks that would get me ready to go do my shift out there in Hollywood. And then I'd take off out there and pour drinks and drink with you guys until the wee hours of the morning, and I'd crawl back home and start it all over again. And, one afternoon, I kissed my little girl goodbye as I had done months and months on end, and I stopped at that same bar in Arcadia and I had those same shots of Cuervo Gold and same Budweiser backs. And Bill Wilson talks about a time in his, out, in his drinking career where alcohol had become his master, and I, I completely relate to that. That's where I was sitting on that bar stool. I sat on that bar stool that afternoon, and I had n nothing different. Same shots of gold, same, Cuervo, same Budweiser backs, and going to the same job. There was nothing wrong with that job, and I didn't love my daughter any less on that day than I love her today but I could not get off that bar stool. I could not get off the bar stool and I drank, I drank through the job and I drank through the kid. And I sat there and I lived off the kindness of strangers there in that little, little uh, area there in Arcadia and I lost the kid for a couple of years and I lost the job, of course, and fell into another job in another dive bar and on it went. I met my husband in that dive bar, the husband-to-be, the guy that I married right about the time we should have split up. 
you know it was just going to be better i mean it had to be the business i've been in this business too long i've been out on the street too long if i could just get married to make my life look like yours looked like i thought yours was and get in there and take care of a home and get the kid back and and put everything back in order and then everything's going to be okay and and so we did. We found a little cozy little wedding chapel out off the Highway 15 out towards Victorville. It was just, just this side of Shed World. Some of you might know it. Um, <laughs> it's not there anymore. But and we got married, and we, and we moved in, and our, and our lives became even more and more violent. I mean, I threw the first punch in this relationship this time, and I just know the drill, and, and it's just more drama. And uh, <sighs> When we got in a fight, it looked like we were getting ready for a garage sale. I mean, I threw, uh, we had this huge coffee table his ex-wife had given us, and it would be the first thing that got rolled out the front door, and then articles of clothing going from the front door to the car, and you know what I'm talking about. And, and, uh, and then in the morning, we'd put everything back together again, and there we'd start all over, and just like nothing ever happened. And, Somehow, I, after a couple of years, I was able to get the kid back, and, and we're, I was watching his kids, and it was just, just location that had changed. I mean, I moved in, uh, 7 a.m., I'm cracking open those tall Budweiser's, and I can't stop drinking. And then everybody's where they're supposed to be in, at night, and I can drink the way I need to. I can open the bottle of whatever it is I'm drinking then, and, uh, until, everybody, and, until I pass out, and then we start all over again the next day. And, my first exposure to Alcoholics Anonymous was after one of those fights. We were at the bar one afternoon, and we were fighting over whether or not I should get off a bar stool, and I lost that fight. I ended up with some black eyes and broken ribs, and not a lot of people feeling sorry for me in that bar. You know, just glad I was leaving. Just take her. And uh, he took me to the hospital, had me fixed up, and then took me home. I mean, that was kind of the cycle, you know. Break them, fix them, take them home. <laughs> And I relate to Larry, too, on this. I just loved his talk. I, I was so lucky to get to come here. And, but, uh, you know, I relate to dressing up and getting to come to Alcoholics Anonymous and going home in the same shape. You know, my clothes are right side out, and they're going to stay that way. And my <laughs> shoes, both shoes are on my feet. And, you know, my hair, well, I couldn't do what the beauty parlor, but, you know, did. But it's the way it, it was when I left. So, um, <laughs> and I love that. I love knowing uh, relatively how it's going to how it's going to be like that. And I, I, I get to, people will call me a lady. They've, I've been known to be called a lady, and I like that a lot. Um, <coughs> But my husband had to leave that weekend for work, and he left me with a nice chest full of beer and a, uh, a big bottle of beef eater gin chilling on top of that beer in the ice chest. And I started drinking, and I started drinking and dialing like we do. And I called a lot of people. I don't know everybody I called, but one of the places I called was a, ba a battered woman's shelter, and I asked the woman who answered the phone to fix my life. And she asked me if I'd ever been to an AA meeting. And what I heard her say was that if I went to an AA meeting, she'd fix my life. So off I went, and I found one that night, and I listened to a woman talk just like you are tonight. And and uh, the only thing that I heard her say was that somewhere during her drinking career, she switched to beer, so I did. I left that meeting thinking, hey, he'll tell you to switch to beer. And uh, my whole life began to revolve around beer all day, all day, all through the morning, all at night, always with me in the car, at home, and um, just m giving me the illusion that I was controlling, some, somehow controlling my drinking. And I wasn't going to let it go. And untreated, I sobriety never occurred to me and i mean untreated without a fellowship without a god without a prayer without you i feel like you've stripped all the coating off my wires i feel oversensitive and underloved i don't know what you meant by what you just said and why you looked at me that way and it just gets worse the focus gets big it gets bad it gets on me I, don't, I have those panic attacks, and I found out in sobriety after several, many, many, many more than I cared to have survived. I would never have walked into them voluntarily, I don't think, unless it was the last place I had, and that it, it was. But for me, those panic attacks, those anxiety attacks, turned out to be just me consumed with me, me consumed with, a, with what's going to happen to me, what are you going to do to me, how's what you do going to affect me, what am I going to do, what, and, and it just went on and on and on like that, and uh, that's, that's what I'm like sober, so getting sober was not, uh, not real attractive <laughs> to me. We got evicted from that place and ended up living in a little room in his ex-wife's backyard, and I got a little job as a result, just a little alcoholic willpower to get the hell out of her house and, um, and move across town. And, and then it was my husband, my daughter, and I, and we lived there for a little while until uh, we had one more of those fights, one more of those fights where you know, the police are in the driveway, the lights are on, the neighbors are peeking out the window wondering what's going on at Charlie and Carla's house one more time. 
the guns on the couch and the daughter's in the, standing in the corner in her mismatched clothes and her unkempt hair and she's looking at me with that fear in her eyes and I can't even bother her. I can't even try to tell her it's going to be any different. I did not set out that morning for things to be that way. I did not set out for that to happen that day. I woke up thinking I'm going to have a shower, I'm going to have some beers and if everybody will just be cool, we'll all be all right. And that didn't happen for a long time. That, did, that hadn't been happening for a long, long time. I mean, the unmanageability of my life was long lost on me uh, for a long time. And uh, we had our last fight, and he left for the last time. And the thing that, that happened was I, I dove into the self-pity. I sat on that couch, and I drank at you. I drank at everybody who had ever done me wrong, all of my family, all of those guys, all of the people that had ever done me wrong. And what it took coming to Alcoholics Anonymous for me to realize finally, finally realized that long after those people were long out of my life, been out of my life for years, I was still drinking and I was still mad. And I had no idea till I got here how fear and resentment had ruled my life. Just didn't, didn't have a clue and didn't have a clue that I had, that I had a way, a, a way of freedom, those steps four through nine, to, to, not, to not have to live that way. And uh, to, live a, to live a good, to have a peaceful head and um, My first sponsor told me that if I wanted to affect a conscious contact with a power greater than myself, just to start accessing a new idea, a new concept of God, that I could start by maybe counting the coincidences in my life. And one of the first coincidences I could count was that I had moved in next door to a woman who had five years of sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. And she came over, she had seen the fight, and she came over and she just brought me the message. She gave me a big book and a 12 and 12, and I didn't get sober right away. I mean. Uh, I could tell that she used to drink like me, and I could tell that she wasn't drinking like me anymore. And what was even more impressive to me was that it wasn't bothering her. It didn't seem to bother her that she wasn't drinking like me. That was the key. I'd seen her joyfully, cheerfully turn down free beers for me. You know, I'd sit out on the front porch, hey, Sandy, how you doing? Want a beer? No, thanks, Carla. I got things I got to do. And it just didn't seem to hurt. See, if I could say no thank you to a free drink, it'd be all I could think about till I could get to the next drink. You know what I mean? It was just, I couldn't do it. So that impressed me. She's talking to me. She's telling me her story, and in her story, I hear me. And I didn't get sober right away. It was another week or so. One Sunday afternoon, I just didn't go back and buy any more beer. And I believe that for me, my psychic change was just happening like shifting sands, you know, just grain by grain, that change of heart, just a cha enough of a change of heart to be able to finally walk in and hang on. And, and I finally did. I, I stayed sober a couple days, and, and then I was, I was real sick. I was real shaken. I'd been introduced to the DTs before, but I never, I was drank through them then. So I, <laughs> I never had to know what that felt like, really. And by Tuesday, I was really sick. And I went back to my neighbor instead of the store. And, and that was just another, another little change. And she sent me up to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, a 12 and 12 study up, up the hill in Sierra Madre. And I went up there. And, and I raised my hand. And I got into the rooms. And I stayed sober for 89 days. I even had a sponsor. But I had that one reservation, that one reservation going way back to the days of the mental hospital where I was just sure that I had those additional diseases, those additional disorders. I mean, after all, all of that medication, not all of you were talking about that, and, and I just re I had those memories. I just knew that, that when I get sober, what happens to me after a period of time? With, and uh, I didn't associate it with being without a program or without a God. I know that today. But um, so I had that reservation. I wasn't sure these 12 steps were going to be big enough to carry somebody like me all on their own. And so I went out. I had to, you know, a beer and a big book sounded better to me than just meetings and uh, doing the steps. So I drank again. But as soon as I drank, it seemed like a, a cosmic memo went out to everybody I'd ever known. They'd sort of stayed away while I was going to meetings and everything. But then they're like right on my doorstep that very day. And I didn't like it. Intuitively, I didn't like it. And, and I wanted back. I wanted it all back. I wanted to go back to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had somehow caught the hope with you guys in that 89 days. I wanted to be here, but I didn't know how I was going to be able to stay. And the only thing that occurred to me is remembering that portion of Chapter 5 that says there are those two who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but they too can recover if they have the capacity to be honest. And I thought, maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe if I just tell my sponsor all of it. And I started to do that, and I haven't had anything that affects me from the neck up since September 25th, 1987. And um, 
<clears throat> and that is my miracle. That's what happened in my life. That's how the change. And and then they t when I got here, you know, they told me you can we we can sober up a horse thief, and then what you got is a sober horse thief. And that these steps are made to ch are meant to change. You know, I can't do the things. I can't live the way that I used to live and be the person I used to be and stay sober. I just can't. I can't handle resentment the way that I used to. I love. I nurse a resentment. There's a line in that movie, Sister, the Yaya Sisterhood, where at the end Ellen Burstyn and her daughter are sitting out on the front porch and. She says, I take a problem and I chew, all, chew on it till all the flavor's gone and then I stick it in my hair. And, you know, I get that because that's just what I do. I just churn on the resentment, just keep it going. And I can't afford to do that anymore. And, and just quickly, I'm going to tell you that, you know, my daughter got into some trouble after a couple of years. I, I took the steps in my first year and I, got to, and I began to sponsor women. So women began to ask me and I got to help them. And I was told when I got here though that if I had 30 days I had something to give to someone who had 29. If I had a car I had a ride to give somebody who didn't. That uh, I could come in here and ask somebody if they needed a cup of coffee or I could set up chairs if I, didn't, if I was too scared to talk to anybody, which I was for a long time. I could come in here and make coffee. Coffee was my favorite commitment because I, I had business and as soon as I got out of my job at 5 o'clock I was in this meeting and the meeting didn't start till 8. You know, but I was in that store and I was buying stir sticks and coffee and creamer and I was in that meeting long before it ever started. And, and I didn't have to have any big words of wisdom. I could be in there making coffee and I had business there so you, you weren't going to throw me out. And, um, and, and I love that. I just uh, come in here. The, bi the big answer in here, newcomer, is yes. Yes, I'll do it. Yes. We're not going to ask you to do anything that's going to hurt you. It's only after doing a few of these things and finding the relief of getting out of myself that I learned even what that meant, of getting out of myself or what self-centered means. It was only after I had a little bit of relief from it that, that's, that I figured out that I was able to understand uh, the nature of my disease. And, my daughter joined a gang. I had to give her some big help. I had to make some amends that uh, I had to make some amends that the kind where you take some action every day and you don't necessarily get to see the result that day. You got to wait, and and maybe it'll never turn out the way that I that uh, that I wanted it to. But uh, they told me to do the footwork and leave the results to God, and that uh, that happened a lot. And but I want to tell you that my daughter's in my life today. She's 25 years old. I have two beautiful grandkids, and I get to watch them. You know, she's forgiven me for all of that stuff that I just don't have time to go into, but I'm in their lives. And, and uh, I went broke, I went bankrupt, chasing the dollar in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I, joined a, I, I joined up with my boyfriend or whatever he was. I thought he was a boss and a boyfriend and everything else and, and uh, loaned him a lot of money in, alcohol, in, uh, in sobriety and, um, and lost that. I was bankrupt at 10 years sober and uh, needed big help. You know, I had to change my home group and change my sponsor and I had to pay that bankruptcy money back on top of it, you know, and uh, because Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me how to take responsibility for myself and the thing about anger and the thing about resentment and the thing that I've discovered most of all for me is that when I can find my part, it happens slowly and over time, but when I can find my part, it sort of takes a sting out of what's going on. It sort of takes a sting out of what's happening, and but I got to find my part in it. And, there, and my part was that that if uh, that if I hadn't set up the house of cards and loaned him all that money, he couldn't have spent it. So um, so there I was, and I was paying this money back, and and uh, now I'm a homeowner, and I've paid a lot of the money back, and uh, and money has never kept me from being anywhere in the world that uh, my God has me to be. I've always been where I'm supposed to be. So uh, I have a new employer these days, and uh, at five years of sobriety, I was raped by an intruder in my, in my own home, in my bedroom. I had done nothing. I'd worn nothing. I'd done nothing um, to, uh, to warrant that except to go to bed and, and uh, and this guy had come in through my kitchen window, and it was somebody I'd known a few years before. And I got to wrap this up, but it was somebody I'd seen get sober 30 days before me. And I saw him get his life back, his wife back, his kids back, and then I saw him get three or four years, and then uh, join the church, leave AA behind, and and go out. And when he went out, he went out like that. He was out there loaded, and he was out there raping some a, a woman. He was raping, you know. I mean, it could, if it wasn't me, it would have been somebody else. And and the thing about that that I that I got was that, you know, we. This is a spiritual program, and, and we, the big book says for us to be quick to see where religious people are right and to go and to seek out and to just keep looking. 
but I've got to remember that there are people who can go to church alone and they can go home after that sermon and have a glass of wine and I've got to come to Alcoholics Anonymous to remember that I'm an alcoholic first and that and that I found my God through Alcoholics Anonymous. I find my God through doing these things with you. I can go to church. I can not go to church if I want to, but I've got to be here no matter what. Um, there was a trial that followed, and my, my sponsor, we had to talk more about resentment, and I had to learn to forgive that guy because we are people who cannot handle even seemingly justifiable resentments. And when I get in fear, I get angry, and, and all of that thing happened all over again, and all that praying for the guy, and he ended up doing some time, and he's out now, and I just hope that he, he's gone to H&I some. Uh, you know, as long as we're standing and alive, we have a chance to come back in. But the detective who worked the case, who had heard sort of a public fifth step because he had called a lot of the people I had known from the bars the year before up to testify against me and to why I perhaps I might have deserved to have that, came to me and he said, I don't know who you were back then, I'm not even sure I want to know, but whatever it is you're doing, keep doing it because it seems to be working. That's Alcoholics Anonymous speaking for itself. You've turned me into somebody that I never, I couldn't even imagine. I don't even know what sanity looks like and yet I have a little bit of it because I walk with you. I want to thank you very much and newcomer, if you if you have any doubt whatsoever, just stay here and prove us wrong. Just stay here, do everything we ask you to do, and prove us wrong. And um, uh, you, I, I just hope you stay. And thanks a lot for my life.